Topic two, classifying liabilities, common liabilities, foreign currency payables, provisions. Accounts payable and notes payable are our two most common financial liabilities. Accounts payable, otherwise known as trade payable, include short-term debts to suppliers and typically occur from a company's operations. These are the values after adjustments for any discounts, allowances, or returns. They may include items such as income taxes payable, current portion of long-term debt, and notes payable. These are written promises. These can be both current and non-current, with the current portion being split out from the non-current on our financial statements, as mentioned in topic number one's video. And these notes payable can be interest bearing, meaning on the face, or they may be non-interest bearing, but we would need to discount them uh, and include the time value of money. So just because a note payable doesn't have an interest on the face of the note doesn't mean that there isn't inherently no uh, interest on that note that we need to discount and reflect that passing of time. Another common financial liability are loan guarantees. This is when a guarantor, so for example, our company, is required to pay a loan if the original debtor defaults. So if we as a company guaranteed a loan for another company or person, we need to record the fair value of this loan and that is calculated at the percentage chance the guarantor, us, would have to pay times the amount guaranteed. You finance people may also call this the expected value. This requires significant disclosure to the users of your financial statements because in theory, um, if and when the debtor defaults, our company would be, on, um, be responsible for paying that full amount. Other common financial liabilities of note are cash dividends payable, monetary accrued liabilities, advances, returnable deposits, and taxes. We also have foreign currency payables. These are recorded in Canadian dollars on our financial statements. They are recorded at the spot rate at the day of transaction. And then each year end or each financial statement date, they are recalculated at the spot rate of that date of financial statements. And the difference between the rate in which it was recorded when it was purchased and the rate in which the foreign currency payable is at the financial statement date is referred to as an exchange gain or loss. And that goes to your income statement, your statement of um. So more to come on that, you'll see it lots in our advanced financial accounting course. Provisions. This is a liability where there requires a large amount of professional judgment with respect to its value and timing. We say that when it's probable, and the percentage uh, for that would be 50% or greater, that uh, the degree of certainty of payout is required in order to record this. And we record this at the most likely outcome. Under IFRS, if there are a range of outcomes, we record it at the expected value, which is recording each outcome by its probability and then sum that amount. This should be re-estimated annually. Under IFRS, there is a difference. Under IFRS, it is recorded if it is likely, which means greater than 90%, and if there are a range of outcomes, it's recorded at the lowest number. A type of provision may be an owner's contract. This is a contract where the costs exceed the benefits, i.e. you would lose money. You would record the provision for the loss in the contract or the costs to cancel it if the con cancellation costs are less. Warranties. Warranties are a type of guarantee that a product will perform as expected. 
An assurance type warranty is also referred to as a cost deferral. And this is when a warranty is provided when the product is sold. So the warranty is, you know, in a sense, bundled or not separate from the product. For this, you would create a provision when the product is sold and expense it. You do that by debiting the warranty expense and crediting a warranty provision. Then, as the actual costs to service that warranty uh, are incurred, you would debit the warranty provision, the liability that you would set up upon the sale, and you would credit the outflow of economic resources, whether it is uh, payables to salary, uh, inventory, uh, or perhaps it's cash to pay somebody to, to fix it. Let's look at an example. In 2020, B Inc. began selling new products that carry a two-year warranty against its defects. Based on past experience, estimated warranty costs are, as a percentage of sales are 1% per year one, 2%, year two, 5%. Sales and actual warranty expenditures for 2020 and 2021 are as follows. We are to estimate the warranty liability at the end of 2021. So let's set up our Excel and walk through the example together. The key to this example, we'll be remembering that there's a two-year warranty for sales that are sold in 2020 and a two-year warranty for sales sold in 2021. And then what that total estimate warranty liability, which would include um, one year of 2020, and uh, two years of 2021. So let us calculate that. In 2020, we sold $450,000 worth of sales. So we need to set up our, our warranty liability, our provision here. So let us do our warranty expense and our warranty liability. And this is to record the warranty liability for the 2020 sales. Okay, now that I know that I have my accounts right, because I'm offsetting the revenues here, and I'm creating my provision for the future um, impact, uh, the future economic outflow of resources to satisf satisfy these uh, this warranty, I now have to think about how much. Well, it was $450,000 worth of sales, and I'm going to times that by my estimate, my reliable estimate for for year one plus my reliable estimate for year two. And I'm doing both years in this year because I sold the um, I sold the product this year. So I need to match the economic reality of that warranty for sales in the present year. So I'm going to incur uh, 31,500 as far as my warranty liability that I'm going to set up for this, uh, for this sale at the beginning of the year. But wait, actual warranty expenditures were 15,000. So I know here that I am going to have a debit for my warranty liability because those expenditures are going to take away from my liability. I have the outflow of economic resources here for that 15,000. And which, what kind of outflow was it? They don't tell me, it's not pertinent to my answer. I'm gonna put it to cash. And I'm going to write my journal entry here to say um, actual 2020 warranty expenditures. Friendly reminder that your journal entries are three parts, uh, the debit, the credit, and the explanation. So you need to have all three parts in order to have a reasonable response. Okay, so at the, at the end of 2020, uh, warranty liability was, and it would be the amount set up here, and then a debit offsets it 
for the amount of, that we actually spent. So at the end of 2020, our warranty liability was 16,500. I encourage you now to pause the video and see what you can do for 2021 and see if you come up with the same answer as I do. Okay, welcome back. Let us do 2021. So in 2021, we sold 600,000 and we are going to set up uh, the same thing that we did here. And the only difference is this is going to be for the 2021 sales. Now we have nothing to do with our 2020 sales because we already uh, reflected the economic outflow of future resources for 2020 by booking both of them in one year to to really reflect the fact that there's gonna be a future outflow of economic resources based on the sales made in 2020. And we're gonna do the same for our, our 2021 sales. So I'm just going to steal this formula here and replace this with our sales for 2021. And then I am going to set up my debit and my credit. Okay, and now, I wanna make sure that I reflect the fact that some costs were incurred during the year. And so that means that I had an outflow of economic resources for 2021, and that was in the amount of 30,000. And they tell us right there in the question. Okay. So now it might be tempting to say, oh, okay, my warranty liability, so at the, end of 2021 my warranty liability was it might be tempting to say okay i set up 42,000 i incurred 30,000 um i you know the liability um the outflow of economic resources was made therefore decreasing my liability so it is 12,000 and i would say close but so wrong and why is that it's because it's a new product and liabilities are cumulative. So this is a balance sheet account, a statement of financial position account. So not only do we want to see what happened this year, but we have to see what was at the end of last year. So we take this and we add up this, and that gets us to, at the end of 2021, our warranty liability was 28,500. One of the reasons that we study is so that we can gain confidence in our technical expertise. So if you find yourself rushing through these and getting you know, almost their answer, but not quite, missing out on little details like this, oftentimes I've seen it because students um, are not quite secure in their knowledge. So I would suggest coming back and revisiting this example closer to perhaps when you're doing your final assignments or right before you're studying for your term tests, do a cold, see how you do, and make a list of anything that you do not uh, get perfect then, and then it's a really great learning opportunity. Let's return back to the slides. Our next type of provision to discuss are coupons or customer incentives. There is an assumption to make. If we're recording this under ASPE, we should record it using the expense approach, would be very similar to the assurance type warranties that we just covered. This is as if the promotional item is bundled and a part of the total sale. And then if it is under IFRS, we would use the deferred revenue approach. Uh, and that would look very similar to what you are likely or should be familiar with from Intermediate Financial Accounting 1. So I'm really thinking about that IFRS 15 right now. Our walkthrough example is going to first look at ASPE and then look at IFRS. Shake Shack Smoothie Bar Corp issues 100 coupons during December. Each one is for a free smoothie and the customer receives a coupon after buying their fifth smoothie of the month. Coupons are only to be used in January. Management expects an 80% redemption rate, smoothies sell for $4 and cost the restaurant $2. The company reports records an expense when the coupons are issued in January, customers redeemed 85% of coupons. So if we're looking at this under the under ASPE or under the expense type approach, we would first record the sale of the shakes, which would be uh, 100. 
times five times four, and that represents the fact that there was 100 coupons issued. Uh, coupons are only issued after buying the, the fifth smoothie. So that means that in order for 100 coupons to be issued, there must have been 500 smoothies uh, sold in during the month. And each smoothie uh, is sold for $4. So that means the company received uh, cash of 2,000 and revenue of 2,000. And then right away for this current sale, they sold uh, $2,000 worth. We know that it costs the restaurants $2. So we have to write the cost of sales for that series of sales. Okay, now we get to the good stuff. The promo expense related to the coupons it reflects um, the estimated sales, uh, pardon me, the estimated redemption of what is going to be redeemed in January. So 100 coupons times the 80% redemption rate times the cost to the restaurant of $2, and that equals our promo expense, our debit promo expense, and we need to set up the liability. So credit our promo liability. Then in January, so after year end, we are going to uh, zero out the account because at this date, um, it can only be used in January. So there is no longer an ongoing liability if people do not, it's a use it or lose it type of situation. And we see that in fact, in January, customers redeemed 85% of the coupons. So right then and there, I look and I think, hmm, actually happened was 85%. We thought it was gonna be 80%. So that means we're gonna have a slightly, we're gonna to have to have a top up to our expense because we underestimated the expense. So we can take that number, and we can just right away look at, you know, 5% times the 100 coupons times by $2 and get our $10. Uh, or we can look at what the total amount of inventory going out uh, the smoothie door would be. So our 85% times 100 times $2 cost of sales would give us the 170 of um, inventory leaving. Um, it, so it really just depends uh, which, which side of this journal entry you want to attack first. So if um, that's the instance um, as well, just keep in mind that your 160 will be leaving because after January, um, there will no longer be, be an outstanding liability. So we need to reverse what we set up, book the difference, and then reflect the economic reality that $170 worth of smoothie inventory is going to be leaving the company. Now, if instead of 85% of the coupons being sold, uh, per, being redeemed, it was 75%, 75 is less than 80, which is what we thought. So we would actually have a credit to promotion expense. I wanted to set this up to show you that if we had overestimated at the beginning or at the um, um, prior to year end, so overestimated, then we'd have to credit the expense. So really this is our best guess, management's best guess. We remove the liability and then we reflect what actually happened via the outflow of inventory, because that's how many smoothies, 75% uh, times 100 times $2 per coupon were to have left. All right, so you can see the parallels between the uh, provisions set up for customer incentives and warranties. Now let's take a look at IFRS. So same details, except now, Remember, under IFRS, we are now looking at kind of the revenue approach. And the revenue approach, we're really uh, leveraging IFRS 15 here. So what they're saying here is that, no, 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 no. You didn't just have a promotion expense when you issued the coupons. You're actually having two different revenue events. You're having the revenue that you sold in December and then you'll have the revenue from when the coupons are redeemed in January. So in order to do that, when we book the initial cash received, it's still going to be the 100 uh, coupons issued because of the five smoothies. So 100 times five times $4 each equals $2,000 in cash received, except now, instead of booking the entire amount to revenue, we need to piece the revenue that relates to the coupons that will be redeemed in January. So we have to, to separate that coupon revenue, the $4 
from um, the $4 in January from our expected redemption rate from the total revenue uh, that was, you know, earned what we saw under ASPE. But now we're saying there's two different streams of revenue. There's one from the regular smoothies and then one related to the coupon smoothies. So we take our same 80% expected redemption rate times by our 100 coupons and times by the fact that this is revenue that sells for $4. And we take that and we piece that out and we say, nope, can't earn that $320 until uh, until those coupons are actually redeemed or expire, right? So in January. We also reflect the cost of goods sold. So we reflect the fact that we did sell 500 uh, smoothies, so the five times 100, and that each smoothie cost $2 in, uh, in December. Then in the next year, we look and now because the smoothies will either, uh, smoothie coupons will either expire or be redeemed, we can book that $320 and recognize that as revenue in the period in which it was earned. And then we book the promo expense. Uh, we can book it as promo expense. We can uh, record it as cost of goods sold and that would be our $170 that reflects the fact that we had 85% of the coupons redeemed, 100 um, of the coupons times 85% times by the $2 per shake. And that was inventory walking out the door. Now, if that changed to 75%, then nothing changes as far as our revenue portion. It was 320 here, 320 here, and that's because um, it relates to the amount of unearned revenue from December. But what does change is the amount of expense recorded. So we book the actual expense as the coupons are redeemed. I'd suggest taking a moment, maybe going back through this video and taking some additional notes because how to record different types of common liabilities is really going to act as the foundation for subsequent topics as well as subsequent chapters. Let's end with a question. Which of the following regarding provisions is false? A. Assurance type warranties are recorded using the expense and provision approach. B. When there are multiple potential outcomes, they should be recorded at the expected value of the outcomes. C. Loan guarantees must only be recorded when the borrower defaults. D. Losses on owner's contracts must be recorded as soon as the loss becomes apparent. Solution. They are all correct except for C. It is not correct that loan guarantees must only be recorded when the borrower defaults. Remember what we said about guarantees. We need to record them at the expected value, that is the percentage likelihood of default times the amount guaranteed. And we also need to disclose a lot of this in the financial statement notes because the users of the financial statements will need to know what the potential entire liability is for the company that guaranteed somebody else's loan. Thank you. I'll see you in the next video.